Brothers, inshallah, fill the gaps. Upon the motivation of the people listening, the speaker speaks. Otherwise, the speaker cannot speak of his own accord. My dear respected elders, brothers and friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept our success and the success of all of humanity in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone in the world is looking for a formula for success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also kept a formula for success. But Allah ta'ala's formula for success is not restricted to this world. Allah ta'ala's formula for success grants a person success in this world and also in the eternal life of the hereafter. Abu Jahal, when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi stood up in the mushrikeen of Makkah and he gave them dawat, he said, I know one utterance, one kalima, one formula. If you accept it, you will become masters and leaders of the Arabs and the ajams, the non-Arabs, will become subservient to you. Abu Jahal stood up and he said, Wa abika, I swear by your father, forget one, wa ashari amthaliha. We are willing to say ten such utterances. Give us ten such formulas, we will accept them all. If this is what is going to happen, if in exchange we are going to become leaders of the world, give us all these ten, we are willing to accept them all. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, there is only one and that is la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. Abu Jahl said, I cannot accept this. Allah Ta'ala's formula for success is very simple, very concise, very lucid. Whoever has the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his life or her life and the blessed ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his or her life, that person is successful in this world as well as in the hereafter. Allah Ta'ala has blessed us that he has made us of the mu'mineen. He has granted us iman. We are very, very valuable. Today we suffer from inferiority complex. We think what is going to happen? What are we benefiting from this iman? But brothers, in this iman Allah Ta'ala has kept our success in this world and the hereafter. Maybe in this world we don't see the benefits, but in the akhirat the benefits are assured. Two fishermen went fishing. Famous story. One was an idol worshipper, one was a Muslim, a mu'min. The idol worshipper, he's saying, Ya Sanam, calling out to his false idol and he is throwing his net and the Muslim he is saying Ya Samad, Ya Allah and Bismillah Rahman Rahim and throwing his net each time they throw the nets when they pull the nets back the idol worshippers net is coming back half filled with fish and the Muslim he is saying Bismillah Rahman Rahim and pulling his fish net back and it is coming back empty now as the day progresses the idol worshippers boat is getting filled with fish and the, as the day progresses, the mu'min is growing more and more embarrassed in front of this idol worshipper. That I am claiming and I am saying and I am inviting him to Islam and saying that mine is a true Lord and mine is a true religion and in mine is a success, in my religion is a success and yet I am getting nothing. The day progresses like this, when it is close to uh, dusk, they decide that let's throw the net one last time. So the, um, uh, the idol worshipper now, he is very cocky, uh, very self-righteous in a manner, self-righteous manner, he flings, he just throws a net uh, matter-of-factly into the water. And the Muslim, the Mu'min Bichara, with all the ikhlas that he can muster, he throws his net uh, and he prays Bismillah Rahman Rahim and then when he pulls back when the idol worshipper pulls back tries to pull back the net he cannot do so he needs the Muslim to help him because it is completely filled with fish and he has to leave it back and now his whole boat is filled with fish and the Mormon when he pulls his net back he gets one little sardine one little fish in his net and he says Alhamdulillah and when he goes to grab it it slips out of his hand back into the water and he says Alhamdulillah this is going on on earth but in the heavens there is a commotion the angels they cannot tolerate this Ya Allah what is this spectacle that this person he bows himself in front of you he sacrifices his sleep in the month of Ramadan he sacrifices his desires his food for you and he is worshipping you all his life and you have embarrassed him like this in front of this idol worshipper you have humiliated him and this other person he doesn't even acknowledge your existence and you have given him so much so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he moves the veils between the angels and that person's abode in hell in the hellfire because he does not have this formula for success he is not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah ko nahi manta Allah ki nahi manta Rasul-e Paak sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ko nahi manta Rasul-e Paak sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ki nahi manta he does not accept Allah he does not obey Allah he does not accept Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his prophet he does not follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah ta'ala shifts all the veils and the angels see the torments and the tortures and the horrible scene of Jahannam and they say Ya Allah if this person if you filled his boat with fish every single day and you give him prosperity no end 
and you give him affluence no end and this is going to be his final abode lakana ashqan nas he is the most wretched and unfortunate of people rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is describing the horrible scene of jahannam and he is saying the lowest person in jahannam who will be the last to be entered into the fire of hell his punishment the lowest ranking punishment and torture of hell is that he will be made to wear shoes of fire due to which his brain inside his skull will boil like a kettle and he will think that i am receiving the severest of and the worst of punishments and on the other hand then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves the veils between this the angels and that person's abode in paradise eternal abode in paradise and they see the ni'mats and the bounties and the hours and the qusur and the palaces and the wine and the food and the drink and the luxuries and the pleasures and they say ya allah if you humiliate this person every single day like this and you take away whatever you have given him and he suffers great adversities throughout his whole life but this is going to be his final abode like an asad al-nas he is the most fortunate of people and luckiest of people rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is describing paradise for us you know in uh, some art galleries if you are into art sometimes they have certain uh, displays and exhibitions so sometimes they have an exhibition uh, titled uh, depictions of paradise where painters and artists with the wonderful skill that allah taala has given them they paint pictures of paradise according to their understanding depictions of paradise oil paintings watercolors and when if you were to go there and if you go into these galleries if you're into that kind of stuff like i am you can just stand there and spend so much time looking at this and completely captivated by this beautiful scene that this person has thought up from his head but our allah taala is saying aidatu al-ibadi as-salihin ma la ayn ra'at wa la udhun sami'at wa la khatara ala qalbi bashar no no this paradise is nothing this depiction of paradise is nothing not even close to the real thing the paradise that i have prepared for my obedient slaves no eye has ever seen no ear has even ever heard of and no mind can ever comprehend the hadith says So there are so many hadith just to give us a flavor and a taste of paradise Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says when it will inshallah be decided for all of us to go into paradise Allah taala will say go you are successful you've lived a good pure life going to paradise we will start going towards paradise and we will approach the outer gate and the door of Jan- jannah and paradise According to one riwayat it will be so wide and vast that if all the men and jinn if all the humans and jinn stand in one saf they will not be able to reach from one pillar to the other from one post to the other this person we will stand there 40 years 60 years will pass and we won't even realize no leg ache no knee ache and we will just stand there the angels will come and tap us on our shoulders brother what are you doing we say we will say look at this they say you think this is beautiful go inside look what allah taala has prepared for you inside sometimes we relate this to the youngsters they say how can that happen so i say time flies when you are having fun i say to them do you not in school we say when we went on the, uh, when you go to alton towers etc when they come back it's been pouring down all day i say how was it alhamdulillah so it was amazing i said but it was raining was it no it wasn't but the queue was 3 hours long was it no it wasn't yes you stood in a 3 hour long uh, queue to get onto one ride but because time flies when you're having fun you didn't realize allah taala has kept little examples of that in the world as well which we have not experienced in, we have only experienced in terms of dunya not in terms of akhirat not in terms of deen sahaba kiram allah akbar one sahabi he says that i decided one night i pledged i made my i set myself i set myself a target that tonight i will worship allah subhanahu wa taala within the haram and i until i am the last man standing this is my target so he says i worshiped and worshiped people came and went after isha salat until i was a final person everyone has left and i was just re- getting ready to go and just then somebody came in and they flung their slippers to one side and then they tapped me on my shoulder and moved me back and stood in front of maqam ibrahim and said allahu akbar and started their salat i was angered infuriated that now i'm going to have to wait for this person i was supposed to be the last man standing so he says then i'm sitting waiting for him he started reciting the quran until he recited one juz one chapter of the whole quran 
Now I'm curious that how when is this person going to go into Ruku? He kept on reciting, I kept on listening. He is reciting, I am listening. This continued and he read 10 and then 20 until he completed the whole reading of the whole of the Quran in one rakat. Then he went into Ruku. Now I am curious that who is this blessed person who is completing the recitation of the whole of the Quran in one rakat? So now I am sitting there to find out, I want to know who this person is. He said when he started to go, he just lifted up his, sh- his shoes and he walked off. Matter of factly, no hoo-ha, no entourage, uh, full sincerity. And then he says when the moonlight fell on his face, I saw that he is Amirul Mu'mineen, the leader of the Muslims. Imagine how much burden he must have, have on him. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And yet he is devoting himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are pleasures that we have not experienced because our iman is weak. Abu Rayhana radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes back from a long journey. And those of us who, alhamdulillah, Allah ta'ala gives all the tawfiq, brothers who go for four months, uh, they experience that when we come back, it is like a honeymoon again. So and those brothers who go for four months every year, they're the luckiest. Allah Ta'ala, if you don't know what I'm talking about, make intention for four months and then we'll know. So, he comes back and he's human, he's like us. They have a pulse, they have blood, they have desires inside them. Allahu Akbar. But what kind of people were they? They were not people, they were men. Rijalun la tulihim, tijaratun. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, he refers to them as men. Again and again, they were real men. He says to his wife, who has adorned herself, beautified herself, not seen him for so long, and his journey was not four months. The Sahaba Kenan went out for unlimited time. So, she's waiting, and she says, he says, if you allow me, if you permit me, I'd like to perform, to offer two rakats of salat, optional salat, in gratitude to Allah that he has returned me home. She said, go ahead. He says, Allahu Akbar, and he does not go, he does not complete his salat until the Fajr Azan is called. And when he starts to go for Fajr Azan, the only thing that could distract the Sahaba Kiram for, was from Salat, was Salat itself. Nothing else could distract them, not even a beautiful wife. And when she starts to go, and she gra- when he starts to go, she grabs his garment. Do I not have a right over you? He says, please forgive me. I did not do this knowingly and purposely. But when I said Allahu Akbar, Allah opened the gardens of paradise unto me. I kept on strolling around. How could I remember who is waiting for me? I didn't even remember who I am. I didn't remember where I am. I just kept on wandering around. And the only thing that awoken me was the Fajr Azam. Allahu Akbar. Where have we drifted from these realities, brothers? These are not fairy tales. And these are things that we should be vying for. We should be striving for. Have we ever performed Salat in that manner that we can say that Alhamdulillah my feet got swollen? One Tabi, he comes back, he, his brother gets him married. He's a young person, he, his brother gets him married. And his brother says to him that, you know, you are to go to that house, that room, your bride will be waiting for you after Isha Salat. But, I have prepared the hammam for you. So first of all, go there, have a bath, then go to your wife. So he says, okay. Next morning he meets his brother. His brother says, how did it go? He says, Alhamdulillah, everything went well. He said, we spent the whole night performing Salat. He said, I didn't get you married so you could perform Salat. He said, it's not my fault, it's your fault. He said, why? He said, first of all, you told me to have a bath. I went to have a bath and the hot water which you had prepared for me, the heat of the water reminded me of the fire of hell. And I was lost in thoughts of the fire of hell. Then I went into the room and the women had decorated the room and my, wife, my bride was decorated and the decoration and the splendor of the room reminded me of the bounties of paradise and I was lost in this thought. And I was caught between these two thoughts and I said to my new bride, let me perform Salat and she said, let me join you. And so I said, Allahu Akbar and until the Fajr Salat, I was performing Salat and she was following me. Where have we drifted from these things brothers? Where have we lost the way? Hunkering after the dunya, which is perishable. When I drop dead, nothing is going to come with me. Even my watch, my beloved mobile phone, which I put a code on so no one else can touch it. Nobody else can use it. That will be snatched away from me. All my valuable contacts will, will be wiped. Nothing of this world will go with me. And nothing of my amals will be left behind. Every single good deed or bad deed that a person has done will go with him. And then we will go into the grave alone. And who is it that will carry me to my grave and throw mud on top of me and walk away and not even turn around to look again? My enemies? No, my brother, my son, my friends, my father. 
and they will walk away and come to my house and sit on my leather reclining sofa and talk about someone else. Reality brothers, does this not happen? So where have we lost ourselves? In the wretched dunya, in the dunya, which is not going to come with us? So brothers, we need to come back onto the path. And this is why these ishtimas take place. And this can only be achieved, the reality of Iman can only be achieved by striving out in the path of Allah. Because we need to revert back to the effort of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Sahaba Kiram. And Allah Ta'ala has blessed us that in this day and age, Allah Ta'ala has given us that very effort. And Imam Malik used to say that the last portion of this Ummah will only be rectified through the effort through which the first portion, first portion of this Ummah was rectified. The effort of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the effort of all the Anbiya alayhi wa sallam. Which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa presented in front of the Sahaba Kiram. And the Sahaba Kiram took on board and adopted. Due to which they were the lowest of law. They were barbarians. Nobody wanted to rule over them. And they became shining stars. And they became beacons of hidayat until the day of judgment. Anybody wants to go to paradise, follow any one of them. They are our beacons. We will have to strive out in the path of Allah. Ghar baithe ye baat hasil hoi nahi sakti. Jis tarah doctori ya koi bhi cheez doctori ko chhoriye, koi tel na sikna chahte. Somebody wants to learn to swim, he cannot do so until and unless he enters into the pool. If he reads all the books, if he does a PhD on swimming and writes books on swimming, how to do the breaststroke, how to do the butterfly stroke, but he does not enter into the water, he can never learn to swim. We want Islam to come and deen and the real deen and all the commandments of Allah and the blessed ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hundred percent to come into our life. This can never be done until, until and unless we strive out and we follow the model of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba kiram. Otherwise, logically think about it. Why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to bear the enmity of all the people? Was paradise not assured for him? The people loved him. Before he announced Nabuat, they had him on their heads. Nobody hated him. Everybody loved him. And when they could not decide who is going to put the Hajr Aswad into the Kaabatullah, they said, they decided Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will do so. They were unanimous in their decision that this guy, he is sadiq, he is amin, he is trustworthy, he is truthful, he is the best character, he is the best man, he will decide for us. Whatever he decides, we will accept. So why is it? All he had to do was come down from the Mount of Hira when he got Nabuat and to worship Allah. He knew that I am the Habib of Allah, I am the best man that ever lived, I am the Imamul Anbiya, I am the Khatimul Anbiya, I am the Sayyidul Mursaleen. All I need to do, and I am the best of all men, I am living in the best of all places, Kaabatullah. All he needed to do was worship Allah in front of Hajr Aswad, Kaabatullah, and leave this world and go straight to paradise. Logic says this is what he should have done, but he did not do. Look into the books of Seerah, look what he did. Allah Akbar, his sacrifices we cannot even talk about, we cannot even comprehend. Ma'isha radiallahu ta'ala says, one month, two months would pass. And not a stove would be lit in any of the houses of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The, pe- the, the dates that people used to discard, we used to eat them, and we used to drink water on top. Try doing that for one meal, brothers. You can't eat more than three, four dates. Your stomach starts burning. And they were starving and discarded dates, drinking water on top. Ma'isha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, we were hungry for so many days and months. And then on one occasion, somebody gave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a gift. And he sent that money home. And that day was a yawmul eid for us. Not because we were going to eat, but because today we are going to feed Sayyidul Awwaleen wal Akhirin, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa Today we will feed him. And so she says that I got the pot. And I cleared the cobwebs from the pot, and I washed the pot, and I got the little meager oil that I had, and I put it on the stove, I lit the sticks, and then I got the maid, I said, take this money, go to the bazaar on the market, purchase some meat, and come back in the meantime, the oil will be ready, and we will cook a meal today, a proper meal, and we will feed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She says, the maid had gone, and the oil started to be heated, and the aroma of the oil rose up, and my hunger was such, try to comprehend this sometimes brothers my hunger was such I could not wait for her to bring the meat I picked up the pot and I drank the oil 
Maisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha is saying that the, the sun of Nabuat, the Shamsun Nabuat is setting on the world and yet in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is pure darkness, total darkness. A person listening to this, he could not comprehend this because he had not seen the time. He said, was there not enough even oil for your, for your, lamp, for your lantern? How much oil? A few milliliters you need for your lantern. Didn't you even have that much? She says, no, I didn't have that much. I swear by Allah, I had to borrow that from my neighbor. If I had that much oil, I would not have put it into the lantern. I would have swallowed it and tried to extinguish my hunger. I had to comprehend this, brothers. Where have we, whither have we gone astray? Where have we, how have we forgotten these lives? So we will have to come back onto this and make a sacrifice. What is sacrifice for us? Hunger? We can't do hunger. Blood? We can't do that. What is our sacrifice? Wealth? Wealth is easy to give. Look at all, uh, mashallah, our beautiful masajid. I just heard the other day, somewhere they built a masjid, one person gave 50,000 pounds. May Allah Ta'ala reward him, give us the tawfiq to spend as well. Money is easy. What is difficult to give yourself? To give your own time. Time is money. We can't give ourselves. And this is what Allah Ta'ala requires from us. That give yourselves, give your energies, give your intelligence. Use your energies for the sake of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And until a person does not go into the swimming pool, he cannot learn to swim. In the same way a person does not strive out in the path of Allah, he cannot gain the essence and the reality and the pure taste of deen and the pure understanding of deen. So this is why these gatherings take place. We are so fortunate. Before the gatherings used to take place in Dewsbury, we had to travel all the way there. Now the elders have brought it to our doorstep. And so how lucky, unlucky we will be if we do not partake of these programs and listen to the blessed words of the elders who have sacrificed their lives for deen. And until, and, and until we don't strive out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were created for this reason. We were brought out from the wombs of our mothers. Ukhrijat linnas, ulama ikiram say you were brought out from the wombs of your mothers for this purpose. It is not befitting the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam or any one single individual of the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It does not befit him that he worries for his own paradise and puffs his own, paves his own path to paradise and goes into paradise. But it is our duty. It is befitting us that we make an effort and a worry and concern for all of humanity. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi did not make, need to make an effort. His own paradise was assured and guaranteed. But look at his sacrifices. Why? We need to ask ourselves the question, why? Let's move on. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The best of all of the ummah. If the whole of the ummah, all the awliya and the ghos and the abdal and all the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if, and all the sages and saints get together on one side, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala on the other side is weightier than all of them. Oh Abu Bakr, when people will enter into Jannah, they will be, get happy. Oh Abu Bakr, when you will go into Jannah, Jannah will become happy. Today the Siddiq has come into me. Oh Abu Bakr, people will, be, will, enter, will be asked to enter into paradise through one gate. And the paradise has eight gates. All the gates of paradise will call out to you that, Oh Abu Bakr, please enter through me. And so all he had to do was, he knew, and he's getting glad tidings from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa again and again. Salam is coming down from Allah, and Allah is asking him, are you pleased with me? Allahu Akbar. One is that we are seeking the pleasure of Allah, here Allah Ta'ala is asking, are you pleased with me? So he knew that I am definitely going to paradise. All I have to do is die and I will go to paradise. He knew that I am the best of the ummah, I am the Siddiq of the ummah, and he knew that I have the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I am living in the best of all places. All he had to do was worship Allah there, stay in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and die and go to paradise. This is what logic says, but we find that this is exactly what he did not do. What did he do? Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha says on one occasion, we were sitting with our father, somebody called out from outside, an adrik sahib, save your friend, save your friend. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha got up and he ran outside. Because he knew that a mob had attacked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was beating him mercilessly. Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha says, when he left us, he had zulfas, he had long hair. He went... And he said to the people, why are you beating this blessed man just because he is calling you towards Jannah, towards paradise and calling you to abandon the worship of idols? 
Why don't you leave this person alone? They put the mob, they left Muhammad sallallahu alaihi alone and they turned on Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and they beat him mercilessly. Until Asma radiallahu ta'ala says when he came back home, he was covered with blood and spit and when we started to cleanse him and clean him, when we wiped his hair, chunks of hair were coming out in our hands. And we know the famous incident, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu why should we hide our Islam? Why not preach it openly? Why not share this ni'mah and this bounty with the people? Ya Rasulullah, let me give a bayan, a declaration openly. Rasulullah sallallahu desisted, he insisted. So Rasulullah sallallahu gave him permission and he goes and he delivers the first lecture and bayan in Islam. For me to deliver a bayan today is easy, but in that hostile environment, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala, at one time he was the chief justice of Makkatul Mukarrama, people used to come and whatever decision he made as a judge, people used to accept. In that same place now he stood and he delivered a lecture and the people pounced upon him. They jumped on top of his stomach. They pounded him with their, the heels of their feet on the, his face. They shooed him and kicked him on his face until the people were convinced that he has died. When they carried him home, they could not, his face was so bloody and so disfigured, people could not tell where his nose used to be on his face. Ask yourselves a question, brothers. Sit in solitude sometimes. Let's ask ourselves, why did he go through all these sacrifices? Was it for his paradise? No, his own paradise was assured. It was for me and you, brothers. Because they knew the foundation of deen is qurbani, is sacrifice. And until and unless the ummah does not give sacrifice, hidayat will not spread. Until and unless a person is not giving sacrifice, let alone hidayat spreading outside, it will not come into his own children. There are many instances, a person dies and with him goes Islam from his household. And the rest of the household is religious. Sacrifice is needed. Let's move on. Umar, Lokana Badi, Nabiyan, Lakana Umar, Umar. Once upon a time, you had great enmity for Islam and for the Muslims. And he had barbaric, barbaristic qualities in him. And he was far from deen. But he made so much effort. He polished his heart so much. Oh Umar, you have cleansed your heart so much that you can now carry the burden of Nabuat and prophethood. If there was to be a prophet after me, you would be that prophet, oh Umar. Oh Umar, you are Jannati. He is from the Ashara Mubashara. Again and again he is getting glad tidings. And yet look at his sacrifices. He accepts Islam and he, the next morning he says to his son that you know of any person who is a telltale. In every community you get a person, Halke Peshka, who cannot keep a secret. So he asked him, is there a person like that in Makkah? He said, yes, such and such. He's got the quality of women. He just can't keep a secret. He said, call him. Uh, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala spoke to him and he said, shall I tell you a secret? Don't tell anyone. He said, yes, sure, I won't. I promise. Wallahi, I won't tell anyone. He says, I have become a Muslim. He said, oh, I won't tell anyone. And then he stood up to leave and Umar radiallahu ta'ala who followed him, knowing full well that he is going to announce this. And so he went straight away that this person went to haram. And he couldn't even wait to get inside haram. And he didn't even wrap his shawl around him, he's dragging his shawl. He got to the door of haram and he announced, Oh people, Umar ibn Khattab has become bedeen, has become irreligious, he is lost. He has left the, the deen and the religion of his forefathers. And the people were shocked and Umar radiallahu was just behind him. And he said, Umar radiallahu announced that yes, it is true. Ibn Umar radiallahu says, I was following my father. This incident happened. The announcement was made after Fajr Salat. The people pounced on Umar radiallahu ta'ala. But Umar radiallahu was not any old person. He fended off the people. He kept on fighting. They kept on wave upon wave of attacks kept on coming and he kept on fending them off. He is alone and there are whole groups and mobs attacking him until the sun came over his head. How many hours that must have been? Until Umar radiallahu was finally exhausted, he fell onto the ground and he said to them, do whatever you want to do, I am not going to leave Islam now. Such sacrifice. Let's move on. Allahu Akbar. Let us ask ourselves brothers, in solitude sometime. Tonight let's sit down and ask ourselves, why did these blessed and godly people do these things? For their own paradise? No, for, the, for our paradise. Uthman, 
او عثمان لكل نبي رفيق في الجنة ورفيقي في الجنة عثمان بن عفان رضي الله عنه every prophet will have a buddy a best friend a companion who will be with him all the time in paradise my buddy my companion in Jannah will be عثمان بن عفان رضي الله عنه and again and again he is known as Zinnurain because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi gave him two daughters one died he gave him the other daughter when she died Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi says if i had 40 daughters one after the other i would give them all to Uthman radiyallahu ta'ala he is also known as Dhul Basharatain the one who got God tidings twice of paradise on one occasion Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi says oh Uthman do whatever you want to do none of your actions can harm you or you are definitely going to paradise and yet so much sacrifice, we don't have to, time to go into his sacrifices. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I am just mentioning the four Khulafai Rashidin, otherwise all the Sahaba Kiram. Oh Ali, Ama tarda an takuna baytuk amama bayti fil jannah, are you not happy, are you not pleased that in jannah your door, your paradise will be opposite my paradise? Your palace in paradise, your paradise will be opposite my paradise. And yet so much sacrifice. So let's ask ourselves brothers, why was this done? Because there was an effort and this effort has died in the ummah now and this effort that's taking place now is to revive this effort again and to bring the ummah back onto this that we realize the purpose of our life we realize where we have gone wrong we realize where we have strayed otherwise to earn the dunya the non-Muslims are also earning dunya and to boast over the dunya, the non-Muslims are doing this. Allah Ta'ala gives the, the worthless things even to his enemies. People who do not acknowledge his existence, Allah Ta'ala is giving them. Because the world has no value in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But deen, deen only comes with sacrifice, only comes through striving, through effort. When a person, he strives out and he puts his foot on his nafs, Allah Ta'ala knows, let's not kid ourselves, striving out in the path of life, somebody tells you it's easy, he's lying, it's difficult, and Allah knows it's difficult, Allah knows we have a pulse, we have desires, we have wife, we have children, we have mother, we have father, I asked one of the elders, I said to him, does it ever get easier? Uh, a person goes out in 40 days, he's leaving his house, his wife is crying, his little children are crying, his ch- daughter is tugging at his garment, Abba, Abba, please don't go, I miss you. And he's going, and he cannot cry because his companions are waiting in the car. Uh, and if somebody asks him, are you crying? He says, no, hay fever. Uh, and then he goes in Jamaat and under the Godru or in the bathroom, he's crying away. In front of Allah, he's crying away. People think, mashallah, he's so pious. But he's crying because he remembers his wife and kids. It's not easy. Allah knows it's not easy. That's why Allah's promises are there. Allah Akbar. That first step when we leave to go out in the path of Allah is difficult. And I asked one of the elders, uh, I said, does it ever get easy? He said, no, in fact, it gets more and more difficult as you get older. He said, when you're young, you're only crying because you're leaving your friends and your mother and father, brothers, sisters. Then you get married, then the gum and the pain is more because you're leaving all of them and your young wife as well. You get on a bit more, then you're leaving your wife and your children as well and your creature comfort. And when you get older even, your kids are married off, then you are leaving your grandchildren as well. Before there were two people stopping you, two children tugging at your garment. Now there's 25 all stopping you, Abba, Abba. So it never gets easy. But in this, in this difficulty is our ease. In this difficulty is our ease. Ease of the dunya and ease of the akhir. And so Allah Ta'ala knows. He knows us inside out. He created us. He kept these desires in us. So when we go out in the path of Allah, the first step that we take is difficult. This is why I always say when we go to these body markers in the big room, I say whenever you enter, you can always tell who's out for 40 days, who's his chelladin and who's his chelladin. Who's on the first day, who's on the last day. If a person is sitting on his own with his head bowed, you know it's his Pelladin. It's his first day. <laughs> because he's quiet, he doesn't want to talk to anyone. And if a person is going around putting attar on everyone, he's buying kitas, he's just had a shower, he's all dolled up, you know that he's going home now. He's happy. <laughs> It's not easy. And Allah knows it's not easy. So this is why Allah Ta'ala says, the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, this is a promise of Allah. When a person goes out in the path of Allah, the first step that he takes, Allah Ta'ala wipes out all his sins, حَتَّى لَا يَبْقَى عَلَيْهِ مِثْلَ جَنَاحَ بَعُودِ 
until to the effect that not even uh, a single thing equal to the wing of a mosquito is left in his account. Allahu Akbar. And our Hazrat Hafiz Sahib, Dhamad Barakatuh, may Allah Ta'ala give him a long life and give us a tawfiq to benefit from him. He says, Jab pehle qadam pe ye milega, on the first step when we will receive this, what about, what do you think you will get when you strive out for 40 days and 4 months and striving out throughout the whole world and logo ke dhakke khayenge, karwe kaseli, baate sunenge, aur saada khana khayenge, aur zameen pe soyenge, garmi sardi badrash karenge, when we will undergo hardships in the path of Allah. Imagine what we will get. No amal can equal this. The ulama ikram, the muhaddithin, great, great muhaddithin. As the Sheikh Rahmatai used to say, that I have looked in all the hadith, in all the kutub of the hadith, sabka kungal dala, I did not find fazilat for any action, more than the fazilat for striving out, and the virtue for striving out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is evident from one hadith even. Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu has been dispatched in the path of Allah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he knows that he is to die in the path of Allah because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesies that if he, if this, he will be your Amir if he dies then he will be your Amir if he dies then Abdullah ibn Rawaha will be your Amir if he dies then appoint your own so a Jew, a non-Muslim, a non-believer who is listening to this he said these three will definitely fall because the earlier prophets used to prophesy in the same manner so when a non-Muslim knew that these three are going to die do you not think the Sahaba Kiram were convinced of their death? Of course they were. They knew. He knew I'm not going to return. So when they are being dispatched, he went to his Amir Sahib and he said, Oh Amir Sahib, tomorrow is Friday prayer. We will be in Safar. We will no longer be able to perform our uh, Jummah Salat. This is the last Jummah Salat of my life. Permit me to return to Medina. I want to perform the last Jummah Salat of my life behind Rasulullah sallallahu in the congregation of Sahaba Kiram in the Masjid Nabawi Allahu Akbar can there be a purer intention than this he was not staying back from the path of Allah like this oh yeah I'm coming I'll join you after 10 days I've got to get my MOT done uh, oh, there's were pure intentions there's were dini religious intentions and so he stays behind and he says to the Amir Sahib I have a very fast stead very fast horse and I will catch up with you and so the Jamaat goes and he stays behind and then the next day after Jummah Salat when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi descends from the pulpit and he sees him he says, Abdullah did I not dispatch you? he said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi yes you did but I wanted to stay behind to get the virtue of performing Jummah Salat in the congregation of the Sahaba Kiram in the com- behind Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Masjid Nabawi Allahu Akbar what pure intentions Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not pat him on the back and say, Mashallah beautiful intentions, you have earned more reward than them. Instead, Rasulullah asked him, how far behind are you from your companions? He said, Ya Rasulullah, only half a day, but I have a very fast stead, I will catch up with them. Rasulullah said, no, O Abdullah, you are 500 years behind them. He did not congratulate him on his, his staying behind, he rebuked him. He said, they will go 500 years before you into paradise because they spent half a day more than you in the path of Allah. And on that very occasion, Rasulullah said, La ghadwatun aw rawhatun fi sabiillah khairun min dunya wa ma fiha. One morning or one evening in the path of Allah is better than the whole world and whatever it contains. And great ulama and muhaddithin have said that the meaning of this is all the amas that are taking place, all the virtuous deeds that are taking place in the world better than this is to strive out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why have we lost these virtues brothers? Why are we not willing? Let us talk to our heart. Let us convince ourselves from inside. Just as when, we, when our wife says to us that let's buy new sofas and we say no, let's go on holiday, we say no. She talks to us, she pleads with us again and again, sweet talk. Sometimes she gets upset, sometimes angrily, sometimes she gives us cold food, but she wins us over. So why can we not talk to our heart in the same way? If she can win our heart over, can we not win our own heart over? Let's talk to ourselves again and again and explain to our heart and our nafs that you have gone astray from the truth path of Hidayat. You need to Bring yourself on this. Life is very short. You're going to die. You're going to leave this world. And this is real earning. And this is a path that Allah Ta'ala placed us on. Rasulullah Sallallahu placed us on. This is a mission of my life. This is the purpose of my life. This is why I have been created. This is why Allah Ta'ala has given me my wealth, my health, my time, all my faculties, my intelligence. Therefore, I need to live for this. I need to die for this. I need to die and strive for the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and go throughout the whole of the world so that the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gets revived. So, brothers, this is why this is the purpose of our life. 
the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become like an orphan child nobody is willing to take on even Muslims are not willing the Muslim merchant he says that no 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 leave Islam to the masjid Do not, I cannot bring it into my business because if I bring it into my business truly if I hold on to Islam then I will not be able to consume interest I will no longer be able to deceive my cons- customers and lie and no longer will I be able to take haram income therefore there is no room for Islam in my business Muslims are saying in their lives, do not bring Islam into our household because then we will have to keep, keep our shadis sadi and we will have to have simple weddings and then we will have to sit on the floor and eat and then we will have to wake up for Fajr Salat and then we will have to strive out in the path of Allah. Nobody is willing to take on the deen of Islam. The deen of Islam has become like an orphan child. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who brought this deen to us once upon a time, he was also a more orphan child and nobody was willing to take him. Da'i Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha so that there is this one child left and he is poor and he is an orphan and if we take him there is no chance of reward for in fact we will only have to spend on him we will get nothing in exchange like Muslims are saying today if we adopt the deen our income will go down we will have to spend and we will have to give we will get nothing in exchange our profits will go down if we do not conceive that we didn't, do not consume interest and if we do not if we do not uh, fool and deceive people we will only lose out we will gain nothing in the same way Da'i Halima and all the women were thinking this but Da'i Halima was that chosen and blessed person she overlooked this and she said it doesn't matter if I don't get anything in exchange she took that orphan child and she had held that orphan child to her bosom and her breast and as soon as she did so as soon as she picked up this orphan child little did she know that this orphan child is the Sayyidul Awwaleen Wal Akhareen he is to be the leader and the, the final prophet and the Habib of Allah and the master of all of mankind and the Rahmatullah as soon as she picked up this child all the blessings and the benedictions came into her life and they continued in this dunya and up to her death and will continue forever and ever in the akhirat the women are saying, O oh, Dai Halima, when we came, you were a cumbersome, you were a burden for us. We had to slow down because your, your camel was so slow, because it, not, it, it had not eaten, it was so weak, we had to keep on stopping for you. You were way behind us. Now what has happened? That you are now racing ahead of us. And she says, it is all because of this orphan child. And her breast is filling up with milk before the people, the whole of the entourage was saying that, Oh Dai Halima, last night we could not sleep because your child Abdullah kept crying the whole night long. Why couldn't you put him to sleep? She said because he was hungry and I had no milk to give him. But today I have taken this orphan child and today not only is my milk enough for my son Abdullah, but it is enough for this new child as well. And time after, later on, they are coming knocking on her door and they are saying, Oh Dai Halima, please tell us which pastures your camels and your animals go to graze on because your animals and your camels and your goats are the healthiest and the fittest and fattest of all and their milk is the best. Where do they go to graze? And she says, they go to the same pastures as yours but it is all due to this blessed orphan child. So brothers, today the the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has become orphan. If we hold this orphan deen to our bosoms and we give it a space in our life, then we will see the benedictions and the blessings and the peace and the solace and the nusrat and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah ta'ala will bestow upon us in this life and also in the hereafter. Like the Sahaba Kiram, they had nothing Allah, and they were the lowest of the low and yet Allah ta'ala then when they took on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah ta'ala blessed them in this world and prosperity came to them until in their houses instead of having mounds of, of wheat they had mounds of gold coins in their houses that was just the dunya that Allah Ta'ala gave them and in terms of deen we know what Allah Ta'ala gave them Allah Ta'ala gave them the ni'mat which we will all receive inshallah right at the end in paradise the last bounty that we will receive from Allah Allah Ta'ala will say I am pleased with you I will never become displeased with you again this ni'mat that we will receive inshallah right at the end after millions of years in paradise this very bounty they received in this world so brothers, let us come back on the path. Let us follow these blessed predecessors. And let us remember the purpose of our life. Let us make ourselves valuable again. We are so valuable, but we have made ourselves worthless. We have made ourselves like other people. We have made eating, drinking, having a nice car, going on holiday. We have made this a purpose of our life. 
whither have we gone? Whither where have we gone astray? So brothers, this gathering inshallah is taking place. We are very very fortunate. Let us not miss out on a single second, a single moment of this gathering. Let us come with our beddings. Let us participate in all the amals. Let us call all our friends. And let us be the first ones to sit in all the gatherings. And let us join other people in these gatherings. Let us listen with an open heart. Let us put our excuses aside. Let us not say I cannot go. My job, my wife, my children, my this, my that. Let us open our hearts to Allah and say Allah nothing is difficult for you there are people living in America and England who go for four months every single year in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ya Allah why not me the sahaba kiram went out they also had wives they did not have most of them did not have one wife they had many wives they had children they had occupations they had businesses they had prayed but the, and yet how Allah ta'ala accepted them so let us open our hearts to acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so brothers, from a raise of hands, please brothers, let's say all of us will attend the Jor and participate in all the Amals and we will bring other people along inshallah.